somebody's riding a grass trimmer out there. So acetylcholine, right? I mean, this is stuff that we should know about. Uh, why should we know about acetylcholine? Well, it's a major sort of uh, neurotransmitter, really important for movement. <clears throat> People like to move, that's awesome. I doubt you're going to see, we're going to kind of breeze through this, because I doubt you're going to see too many clients who are taking medications to um, alter their acetylcholine levels, <clears throat> right? There are a few specific instances where this might be the case. We'll touch on those, but I do want you to be aware of acetylcholine, largely because there are some side effect issues to worry about if they are taking things that are affecting their acetylcholine levels, right? So there's some things we need to think about. <clears throat> Anybody ever taken a medication that affects acetylcholine levels? Atropine? Anybody been on that one? Nobody. Nobody's on atropine as a regular thing. Anybody had a, not to answer this, like a surgical operation where they didn't want you to choke to death? Sometimes they do want you to choke to death, Jason. But sometimes they don't. Like uh, your wisdom teeth out or something? <clears throat> they don't want you to choke them then. They might give you atropine for that. I think they did when I had mine taken out. I don't remember. I do remember eating a cheeseburger immediately afterward. So I, my mom, I was in college, right? So I was like, yeah, I know, right? I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I was dumb. But I, I, tried, to, I tried to convince her I could drive home, uh, which I, I think is a fairly common thing. And then I convinced her to take me, take me and get a cheeseburger. She said, as long as I got French fries and not chips, it was fine. <laughs> so that's a persuasion I have, right? Uh, it all worked out though. I mean, my jaw's still in place, so that was good. 12, 15 years ago, 18 years ago, I don't know. That was like a freshman in college. Acetylcholine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about synthesis, release, and activation. We'll talk a little bit about activation of the cholinergic system. I think it is important to refresh you because I know you guys remember this. You, you all took biobases, right? <laughs> so I know you remember the importance of acetylcholine from biobases. Um, just your head goes the other way, Jason. Up and down. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of weight on that <laughs> Was that another one you were gambling with the C? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you guys have heard of curare, we'll talk about that a little bit, right? Um, it's uh, found in a lot of South American plants, some of the barks. It's used uh, for uh, like poison arrows. It's pretty awesome, right? It actually causes muscle uh, paralysis. So that's exciting, right? Uh, if you guys want to like stop something from moving, take some curare. There were actually these guys back in the 40s, so this is pretty crazy. Uh, there was always this debate about whether or not giving someone curare caused uh, just paralysis or if there was any um, like analgesic or altered consciousness effects, right? Uh, yes, so, so how do you test that, Jessica? Well, you've got to take curare, right? And then you, you've got to wake up out of that and tell people like, geez, that hurt when you kicked me. Um, and so that's exactly, I mean, I don't know that they kicked the guy, but that's exactly what, what happened. There were some researchers who took curare and then when they came out of that, they said, that was the most frightening experience of my life. I actually just couldn't move. I was not in any way anesthetized. I was paralyzed, mm -hmm. and it was frightening. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually uh, curare blocks the receptor. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. Cholinergic. Uh, acetylcholine is actually pretty straightforward. You guys remember that dop dopamine pathway, norepinephrine pathway? There were like 837 steps. It wasn't that many. There were like three or four, right? Uh, acetylcholine's made pretty simply, uh, just from acetylcoenzyme A or acetyl-CoA uh, in choline. There's a guy called Chat, choline acetyltransferase, slams these two guys together. It's pretty straightforward. That's great. Uh, you don't really, because it's so involved in, in muscle movement, it's really a great idea to not have a big delay, right? Trying to create acetylcholine. You need to have this stuff ready all the time. There's that pathway. It goes back and forth, so you know if you need to break things down, not a big deal. Um, that chat that uh, is only found in neurons that actually make acetylcholine. 
It's going to be a slightly different story later when we talk about glutamate, right? How many of you are amino acid fans? Like everybody should be, right? Because your entire body is made of amino acids, so glutamate is an amino acid, unlike uh, some of the other neurotransmitters. So all of your cells actually make glutamate. So Cassie, if we were going to say, hey, is this a glutamatergic neuron? Well, I mean, they all make glutamate, right? So it's kind of, well, I don't know. Uh, we have to look for other things. Acetylcholine, easy story. If you've got chat, you're making acetylcholine, you're going to release acetylcholine. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why it's been, why there aren't sort of um, pharmacological treatments uh, or uh, interventions that target the cholinergic system is because it's been difficult to find and make drugs that do this in a really sort of selective way that can be controlled, right? Uh, and because of that, it's been difficult to do. There are a lot of folks who originally thought, hey, we can jack up someone's acetylcholine levels and that'll help with Alzheimer's. Acetylcholine plays a role in learning and memory, uh, cortical activation, it's found in like the hippocampus, places that you think might be important. Uh, it's found in areas that are targeted very early typically in Alzheimer's progression. So it makes a lot of sense, right? If we can target acetylcholine levels and get that to go up, then maybe we can see some help. Um, <clears throat> they actually had a, some drug trials. One of those, they, uh, they actually found a way to you know, increase acetylcholine levels uh, through, through a particular mechanism. Not, it actually raised acetylcholine levels that really seemed to change cognitive performance. Uh, and it did this wonderful side effect that made all of the uh, people smell like fish. It gave them a weird fishy smell. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, I mean, it's like, well, you can remember what you did last week, but you're going to, you know, smell like a nice, you know, filet of cod or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, like, you know, it's like, uh, who cares what I did last week? It's going to smell nice. Uh, I, think, I think most people would choose that, right? Mm -hmm. and that's what you think anecdotally, but whatever. Uh, we're going to package stuff in vesicles. That's not surprising. We've done that before, right? Okay. Uh, there's a specific vesicle transporter. <coughs> not a big deal. Here's acetylcholine. Pack it in a vesicle. We've got an action potential coming down. I'm going to drop that off at the synapses. There are two receptors for acetylcholine, the nicotinic and the muscarinic uh, receptors, they are sort of activated either by nicotine or um, muscarine, which is something that we found experimentally. This is not something naturally necessarily occurring in your body, right? These are, ion some are inotropic, that's the nicotinic, and then uh, the apotropic or the muscarinic. We'll talk about that as we need to, and uh, think about those fun things. This would be a dumb question, but those, those full vesicles that contain the Acetylcholine. Yeah. Do they also contain other neurotransmitters, or do each, does each neurotransmitter have its own vesicle? That is probably the least dumb question that has been asked in this class. <laughs> uh, it's actually, yeah. So the answer is, yeah. Uh, and, and so I wasn't actually going <laughs> to talk about this right now, but we'll talk about it right now just because you brought it up, right? So some of these vesicles. And this isn't just for acetylcholine, this is for any neurotransmitter, right? Some vesicles only contain a particular neurotransmitter, whatever it is, right? It's kind of hard to tell if they contain multiple types of neurotransmitter. We think that's a possibility. Uh, stepping beyond that, it gets, a, it gets a very complicated and interesting story, right? So we're thinking about a cholinergic neuron, but there are also cholinergic neurons that are dopaminergic, right? So they'll create acetylcholine and dopamine. What's interesting about some of these, and it also works with glutamate and some other things, not only might we release them, so we they do release both at the same synapse, right? Both neurotransmitters, or multiple neurotransmitters. They may also segregate those, so only some, amazingly, only some synapses release one neurotransmitter, and some synapses release the other neurotransmitter. So you can have sort of multiple and divergent effects from the same cell. It's pre pretty awesome. That was actually a big debate for a long time. Now, that's only been settled relatively recently. Uh, I, I don't mean like the last six months, but in the last few years, have, as we've uh, developed better molecular techniques to look at these 
uh, transporters, right? That's what you have to you have to see, right? So you look for these uh, vesicular transporters. See, you know, if you have those in different uh, neurons and different terminals, and as we've been able to localize those, we've seen that it's basically any sort of combination. Why the answer is Sierra yes to that question is because it's all of the above, right? It, it um, yes, sometimes it's only acetylcholine, sometimes it's acetylcholine and something else. It sort of um, depends on the situation and what that particular neuron is, what its role is. Well, that was actually a really good question, Jason. If you have any more of those, you know, spread them out over the semester, but go ahead and ask them. Don't use them all up on this day. That's a great question. Why didn't you guys think of that? Great answer. <laughs> Uh, there are a ton of toxins that will affect acetylcholine release. Some of these are more exciting than others. You know, uh, black widow spider venom actually causes a massive release of acetylcholine, right, which will cause you to have convulsions. The problem after you release all of your acetylcholine, uh, any, any idea what happens then? You die, right? I mean, that's what happens. Um, Is it because you don't have enough release? Absolutely. Okay. And so if you need acetylcholine for your muscles to contract, what's mm -hmm. what's the heart, right? Yeah, that's like the muscle you definitely need to constantly have working, right? Mm -hmm. The other muscles, you can let those go, right? You don't always have to be using your, you know, um, serratus anterior, right? I mean, who cares what you do with that? What's that? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, also known as the, it's also known as the boxer's muscle. So if you see a guy, like, and it, He's fairly fit, and you think like those are his ribs, kind of up close to his armpit. They're not. That's the serratus anterior, right? And so it's kind of serrated. Now those are the those are the lats, kind of in front of that, more more around the ribs, like on the upper. You got it. I feel like I should bring up like a Bruce Lee picture here and show you guys like surface anatomy, but. <laughs> Arm muscles. Yeah, it's like it looks like really high ribs, but they're not ribs because the guy's not starved. That's the serious. And they call it the boxer's muscle because it moves your arm forward like for a jab. But so you didn't say you gotta watch out for that. For what? Black widows? Yeah. You'll never see them, so why? <laughs> no, they're so small. I'll just get you. <laughs> the nice thing about a black widow is, you know, so many people freak out about this, right? Like, oh, there's a black widow spider. Well, unless you're like super young, old and decrepit, or have some other health problem, you're probably going to be fine if they bite you. You're not going to feel the car. I mean, trust me. Uh, <laughs> but you're not going to die, right? Most healthy, you know, robust individuals could take a, a, a bite from a, a black widow spider. That's pretty, that, that gives you some peace of mind, right? It is a highly toxic uh, poison. I mean, it is quite possibly one of the most toxic poisons around, right, that, that you get. But there's like such a small amount of it that's actually in the spider. It doesn't really do much to you. I mean, it does stuff to you, but it's probably not gonna kill you. Yeah, right? that list doesn't so like appetizing. You know? Oh yeah, muscle pain, tremors, nausea, vomiting, salivation, copious sweating. Yeah. <laughs> Those are all the fun ones. Oh, that's why they give you atropine. So who remembers that time, Jessica, you had your wisdom teeth out and they gave you atropine, so you didn't salivate too much and choke because that's an anticholinergic, atropine is, right? So it's going to shut down your cholinergic system, going to shut down salivation, right? If we activate that system, we're going to do the opposite, right? It makes sense now, right? There you go. Um, the other one we could talk about is botulism toxin. That's a fun one, right? Uh, we, we talked about Botox in here briefly, right? Because we had that whole like Dennis Quaid conversation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, causes muscle uh, paralysis as well. Comes from this bacteria. Not a big deal. Uh, also, I mean, they, they use it to treat other things. Uh, migraines, sometimes uh, epilepsy. There's some ep epilepsy treatments that might use botulism. Uh, toxin. Uh, again, if you want to get rid of those crow's feet or smile lines. Excessive sweating. Excessive sweating, that's the other one, right? Uh, yeah, so if you have excessive sweating, they'll, they'll kill those. Because uh, you have the, the sweat glands, you know, they're going to contract and squeeze out sweat and so forth. We're going to kill off that, uh, that system. 
typically botulism is temporary, right? It's not something that's going to last forever. So if you go in for a Botox treatment, you're going to need another one. That's how they get you. It's on the subscription. You know, first visit's free, and then they charge you. I don't know. Um, so that's fun. So what botulism does is it um, it blocks that um, that release. Not a big deal. So if you're not releasing a seal choline and you're not having, uh, you know, things go on. The other thing you can do to not have wrinkles is never make a facial expression. If you just stare at people blankly, yeah, just like that. Kyle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I don't have to worry about wrinkles. Uh, so acetylcholine levels are controlled by whether or not you have choline or acetic acid. Um, you know, that's going to be the breakdown products of acetylcholine esterase. That's the, uh, the chopper that's going to break up acetylcholine. This is going to be great because, again, you want to be able to relax those muscles after you contract them, right? So we're going to have a mechanism to make that happen, and that's acetylcholine esterase. Not a big deal. There's the process. Notice we're not breaking it down into the exact same products that we had before, right? Because remember we had acetyl-CoA, so we're going to break it down to something different. So that we don't want to just like slam back together. There are different kinds of acetylcholine esterase. You've got a few varieties of these. One in particular is found at the neuromuscular junction, right? So this is important. Uh, it's going to stimulate that uh, uh, muscle contraction. Not a big deal. Any choline that is left after ACH breakdown, so we're going to break it down into acetic acid and choline. We're going to pull it out with that uh, choline transporter. Not a big deal. If you block that, uh, you can actually reduce the uh, acetylcholine production. Mice, uh, so hey, let's talk about mutant mice again. I know how excited you guys were about that last time, right? Think about these like giant mice attacking you or whatever. Uh, if you don't have choline transporters, you're, you're probably going to die. Okay. The reason for that, again, is you know, your, your primary functions, your heart's not going to work, you're not going to have any breathing difficulties, um, it's going to happen as well, you're not going to be able to make those contractions, right, so that you can continue to breathe. It's not a big deal. So this recycling process is very important if you have alterations in that, it can be fatal. Again, not really any clinical applications at this point you guys need to think about. <clears throat> Although there are times when you might want to, um, like you guys know myasthenia gravis, anybody heard of that? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few moments. There are times when you might want to start altering acetylcholine levels, but you have to worry about, uh, you know, worry about problems like toxicity issues, right? <clears throat> so if you're going to start altering cholinergic transmission, um, you don't want to do too much, you know, and one, you know, you don't want to turn it up too much, and then it's basically like a black widow bite, and you don't want to go too little, or that's kind of like you've given that person curare, right? So you're, you want to make sure you're careful about how you do that. Not a big deal. Um, you can use things as medicines or as poisons. That's fine. We'll talk about poisons later. Uh, if anybody wants to, like, you know, kill off somebody with some deadly nightshade or something. I don't know. We can have a whole conversation about pupil size, too. That's going to be exciting. Seriously, Kyle. You gotta watch people with big pupils. <laughs> I'm trying to trick you. Just big eyes. What? She looked at me to check my pupils and I said, I just have big eyes. You gotta watch those people too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were worried about things whether you can get across across the blood brain barrier. Uh, again, there have has been some use of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, right? for the um, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there is an area called the uh, you know, forebrain cholinergic system. That's where a lot of your cholinergic neurons, you know, that's kind of one of the main areas there for your uh, cholinergic neurons. Those are ones that drop out in Alzheimer's disease. So if you're inhibiting the breakdown of acetylcholine, which these guys are creating, then the idea is that maybe uh, that can offer some cognitive benefit, right? <clears throat> 
again, you have to worry about the toxicity effects of jacking up acetylcholine levels, right? So you can have some serious side effects there. Uh, the other thing to consider is this is not by any means a cure, right? It's sort of a temporary treatment. The progression of the disease is still going to move. You just are going to artificially sort of um, for a brief period of time have enhanced acetylcholine levels. So watch out for that. Uh, how many of you love glaucoma? <clears throat> nope, nobody loves glaucoma, right? But there are some acetylcholine um, uh, esterase inhibitors that are used to treat glaucoma, right? The problem is uh, they can also serve as poisons and kill people. So, not a big deal. So how do they do that? Do they apply it or? <coughs> They'll apply it directly to the eye. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to want to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You're not going to want to like take a big drink of that, right? Line up some uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitor shots or something, right? Because uh, you probably don't want to give that a try. Yeah, so you're going to want to apply it directly to the eye. And it's okay. How many of you have ever been to the eye doctor? Yeah. Yeah, you've had uh, stuff applied directly to your eye that's screwed around with your acetylcholine, right? That's when we're going to talk about those people with the big pupils. To watch out for them. They can't watch out for themselves <laughs> <laughs> because they can't see, right? I mean, you've had your people's dilated, right? Yeah. You can't see anything. Never you've never had what fucking eye doctor are you guys going to? Um, all of them. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? The ones that are licensed. <laughs> I swear to God, I've never. And had you it. even have one. And I've been one since like third, third grade. They don't. I don't think they dilate at Walmart. Do you have to have vision like, levels? What are you people doing, doing at the eye doctor? Just, like, no. I've been to the eye doctor and they That's never did standard. that. Yes, yeah, really? thank you. I don't, I don't think it's every licensed place. Where you have to wear the sunglasses all day? Is this like an Ohio You don't have to wear the sunglasses. I mean, like, what people do. No, I've never heard that. Why are people touching your eyeballs? So the purpose is to make your pupil bigger so they can see your retina. Uh -uh. No, never happened. So to me. give you a bigger, uh, give them a bigger view of your retina. Oh yeah, mine just told me to so Yeah. yeah. Do they do the yeah. blow in your eye thing. Yeah. That's the test for glaucoma. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. other one where you like. It's different. Wash. Nobody ever. No, it's like you blow. They don't put eye drops. Uh -uh. Like. It's <laughs> Ohio. It's Ohio. It's Ohio. It's Ohio. It's Ohio. You guys, Ohio. It is Ohio. We are all of them. It must be. They don't do that. That's true. Some weird shit. I'm going to ask next that, time I get an eye doctor. To dilate my eye. Oh, my God. You're not dilating my eye. Why are you touching my eyeball? Because other people are getting their eyeballs on me. Well, they're not going to, like, touch it. I mean, they're just going to put drops in there. Oh, my. All the same. Uh, here is myasthenia gravis. This is an autoimmune disorder. Uh, so you may see some folks. It's fairly rare. I guess you're going to run across somebody that has this. Uh, the issue is that it creates antibodies against their uh, muscle cholinergic receptors. So if you're blocking those cholinergic receptors, uh, obviously you're not going to be able to, to have muscular contractions. You're going to lose uh, you know, muscle strength. You're going to get fatigued pretty easily, right? You might give folks a, uh, you know, some of these drugs that will um, inhibit acetylcholine esterase so that the acetylcholine will be available longer. Again, this is not a cure. This is a symptom treatment, and the progression of the disease is going to continue uh, up until death. So there you go. There's the uh, receptors that are blocked by the antibodies. And yes, all antibodies are shaped like a flux capacitor, just in case anybody was curious. Megan, I know you were going to ask that. That, that is... Uh, so you want to increase uh, acetylcholine levels at the synapse so they can activate which receptors are available. That's not a big deal, right? Uh, other things that you, I mean, this is something to worry about are those uh, organophosphorus compounds. How many of you love pesticides? <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly what these are, right? They're actually irreversible inhibitors of ACHE. They're great insecticides. You know, what can kill you can also kill an ant, right? I mean, that, that makes some sense, right? They use acetylcholine the same as we do, right? So, you know, right? So we can just really take care of that. Not a big deal. Definitely a poisoning risk for humans if you have folks who work in um, like agricultural fields, right? And I, 
didn't mean that. I meant field broadly, not right. So there you go. Montana <laughs> got, got where we were going with that. Uh, so if they work in the agricultural industry, they could be exposed to these. Um, if you have anybody who's a uh, who's an exterminator, for example, right? They may be exposed to some of these compounds, and they can really cause a problem. They're particularly bad during development. So if you're like a pregnant agricultural worker, that does happen. You guys thought that was funny for some reason. It's very specific, very specific problems. There you go. Uh, how many of you have heard of nerve gas? How many of you always wondered how nerve gas worked? Like, whoa, nerve gas, that's bad business, but I don't know how nerve gas works. <laughs> uh, nerve gas, like sarin, for example, you guys have probably heard of sarin, mm -hmm. right? That's an irreversible ACAG inhibitor. So that's how that works. So in Syria, when they, that's what they released on the people, right? Bingo, yeah. And they washed, they were trying to wash them off. Would that not help if they've already gotten it in their system? So nerve gas is absorbed, uh, absorbed through the skin, yeah. right? Uh, typically, <coughs> or in, inhaled. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if there is any on the skin, you can try to limit exposure. They're already, already going to have some exposure uh, to it, but if you can limit that, then, then you can. Uh, you know, lessen the effects potentially. Uh, but yeah, that's that's exactly what the, the problem was there. What was that like? 2013 was the last time the UN officially said they did that. Uh, it's been used a few other times uh, since uh, since then, of course, and then before then. Uh, so, like those people would never recover if it was yeah. in their system. Yeah. Uh, so because because that's um, it's pretty bad business actually. Uh, the flip side of this are, uh, you know, like, so let's imagine we were going to, uh, this was a big deal during the Gulf War that I doubt many of you remember. Uh, I think any of you are, I don't know your birthdays specifically, but I doubt any of you are, you were probably alive in the early 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Close. I'm an 80s kid. You're an 80s kid? Yeah, Which end of the 80s? 81. Seriously? No longer the oldest person in this room. <laughs> Not by much, but thanks, Jason. You know that time I told you I might give you a C? Yeah, the percentage of that just decreased. You're much less likely to get a C now. That's good. <laughs> so you guys have heard of uh, Gulf War illness, right? No? Gulf War syndrome? Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there we go, right? Because we're both in the go, VA, that's why. Have you guys heard of a thesaurus? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is something for those of you who work at, at a VA, which a number of you will, right? I mean, that's one of our sort of, I don't know, is that a major site that we have? I, I see a lot of folks who go to the VA, right? So that's, that is a place where some of you could end up. You could work with veterans, you may see this. They, they say maybe, maybe like what, 25% of the guys who served during the Gulf War have a Gulf War illness or syndrome, right? That's a pretty high percentage. The reason they think this is because uh, there was a major concern that, uh, that nerve gas was going to be used on US troops. And so what you can do, there is a, there is a remedy for this, right? There is sort of a, uh, I don't wanna call it an antidote, it's a pre-antidote. Right? And it's these pills. You can take these pills. <laughs> if you think you might be exposed to, uh, to Sarah, to nerve gas, right? Now, the problem with this is there, uh, if you take too many of these, right? Uh, so these guys were instructed to take like three a day. Like they, yeah, like like if they thought they were going to be right because like wh what do you what do you want? Do you want to take this thing that we know is not going to make you like go back here like you know death by asphyxiation? That sounds bad, right? Paralysis. You don't want that to happen. So you're going to take these pills. What these this uh, this stuff does is it actually interacts with the um, acetylcholine esterase and it actually sort of gives it some protection from that inactivation, right? So even if you're exposed to nerve gas, your ACAG will still work, right? So it's kind of this preventative coating, so to speak, that you're going to put on your ACAG. Uh, but obviously, I mean, if I tell you, Kyle, like, hey, here are some pills. If you take these um, and you get hit with nerve gas, you'll be fine. What are you going to do? You're going to take about a handful, right? And you're going to gamble with that, right? Because I'm not telling you there's any 
negative side effects to taking these pills. We didn't know there were any negative side effects to these pills, right? But the, uh, the high percentage of, of folks who were, were coming back from the Gulf War with a Gulf War illness and the invasion of Iraq, right? So folks who were in those, those operations, those theaters as well, they were given the same, a similar protocol. Right? And so you may see uh, similar, uh, and Gulf War syndrome is a, it's like a very broadly, it's a multi-symptom complex sort of thing, right? Um, do you guys, have you seen anybody with that? They haven't really seen anybody. anyone. <laughs> Welcome to the government. I see go. people, and I'm in government. Yeah, I've always got problems. It's all one person there. Good luck with that. <laughs> so what does it do to you, Gulf War illness? Yeah, it's like a, I mean, the symptoms are pretty broad, um, and I think it's, it's not terribly well defined. Uh, a lot of fatigue, chronic headaches, uh, problems like that. Uh, there's, a nice, there's something from the U.S. Department of Veterans. You guys probably have access to this, right? Yeah. Check that out. Yep. So there are a ton of um, issues that, uh, that, that uh, come out of this. If you think about acetylcholine and the broad effects of acetylcholine, right? I mean, we talked about issues with <coughs> nausea, vomiting, breathing, muscle weakness, um, memory problems, right? We talked about cognitive issues, trying to give folks uh, acetylcholine boosters to help with Alzheimer's, right? So you can see why if, if you've had some issue with your acetylcholine system, you're going to have a broad constellation of symptoms. You can see why it's going to be hard to define, why it's going to be hard to diagnose, right? Can you imagine uh, Gulf War syndrome ever making it into the DSM-12, whatever whatever one it's going to be? No, right? Be be because of how hard it is to define what it is, right? And how hard it is to think about the, the symptomology of that and the other sort of uh, confounding issues. But at least the... Um, you know, there are folks who do recognize this, and there's some resources out there for folks. So, does that work? Questions about that? Oh. They do not prefer the term Gulf War Syndrome, so don't use that at the VA. Mm -hmm. Apparently. Because that sounds like something the Gulf War caused. That's what I was thinking. It's, like, it's not the Gulf War's fault. Well, <laughs> it was the people kind of running the Gulf War. It might have been their fault if they were telling you to take these pills all the time, right? Yeah, those people also fault. go to the VA right now, so they wouldn't like that. Huh? Those people are also probably at the VA and they'd be offended. Yeah. I don't know. You just talk to them, see what happens. But if you're at the VA, yeah, because, uh, you know, if you're thinking about you're not going to see a lot of that. You're not going to see any World War II veterans, right? You're not going to see any Korean War veterans, really. You might see some Vietnam veterans, right? So they, they, they'll have their sort of, uh, I'm trying to think about how old people are, right? They said they have three World yeah. War II veterans. Really? Uh -huh. They're in their 90s, but. There are only three of them. There's only three yeah. of them. Yeah, there are only three of them. They have their own group of three. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I mean you're not going to, I mean, let's be realistic. By the time you guys graduate in another three years, this guy's going to be dead. I, I, mean, I mean, most of World War II veterans are going to be dead. Korean War veterans are even, I mean, geez, those guys are getting old, right? That was 50 to 53. So even if you were on the young end, you know, in 53, and you, know, you can add, like, how many years is that? That's like 65 years. So, I mean, I mean you're talking about somebody in their late 70s, early 80s. Uh, so even those folks are going to be kind of aging out of the system and, and into that. Um, so you're going to be left with like Vietnam veterans if you're working in the VA, uh, folks who were, you know, not like combat veterans, and then uh, the next group of folks are going to be the Gulf War and the, you know, recent uh, campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq. So there you go, right?
There you go, that's the uh, history lesson for the day. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a question. I feel like I'm always like, I have a question. Um, so I'm sitting over here thinking, what about like when your muscles cramp? Like is this, like, is that kind of all That's a lack of gas issue, typically. Okay. Uh, no, it's going to be a separate mechanism. Okay. So don't worry, like, if you get a muscle cramp, like, all of a sudden you think your acetylcholine system is screwed up. You'll also, does anybody have uh, fasciculations? What does that mean? Twitches. <laughs> Twitches. <laughs> happens to everybody, right? Like eye twitches? Uh, possibly. That happens particularly when you're stressed. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Harris Hall. I don't know why any of you we guys all. would be stressed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes it happens arms, muscles, you know, arm muscles, legs, whatever, right? You just have a little, like sort of, mm -hmm. you won't shake, but your muscles will just twitch, right? Uh, that's because of like an accidental dump of acetylcholine. Mm. Yeah. What about when people twitch a lot right before they go to sleep? That one. <laughs> yeah, what's that mean? Like, why well, don't look at me? <laughs> <laughs> <That's a good laughs> question. What do you mean they twitch a lot before they, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like early, twitches. Yeah, in yeah. early. Wait, oh, why I'm talking about like, which which like that. Another boyfriend that was like I was having ex like the exorcist was having me when I fall asleep. I'm not talking like, about exorcist twitches. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> like twitches happen like when you're trying to sleep. So I feel like that face is not warranted. Like, it's really <laughs> like a normal thing. I've never heard of this. Josh twitches twitch a lot. Insane as he's like, right, right as he's falling to sleep. Yeah, I think that's. Fishing. I think that's probably more of a uh, sleep transition issue, mm -hmm. and, um, and and it does involve acetylcholine, right? Because your acetylcholine levels change quite a bit as you go into to sleep because acetylcholine is a sort of a cortical arousal, right? So that's going to shut off uh, while you're asleep. So there can be some like transition issues there while you're coming in and out of sleep. Because uh, you're going to have to take your, your, you're going to disconnect your brain from your, your muscle system, right? Because uh, particularly during like REM sleep or something, um, so you don't get up and like act out your dreams, which can cause you problems. Does that work? Get separate beds. <laughs> Things to remedy if it's really that much of a problem. It's not a problem. It's just one Put like a partition between, I don't know, right? We just live apart now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that works. That's why. Twitch all you want. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, it Let's see. Yeah, sympathetic, sympathetic neurons. You don't really have to worry too much about this. For two years. <laughs> now, this is kind of interesting. Um, if we want to think about, we talked last week about dopamine, sort of the role in Parkinson's disease. They will also use uh, drugs that affect acetylcholine levels to help treat Parkinson's early on, right? They will give you drugs that'll kind of uh, uh, knock down the acetylcholine level just a little bit, because you want that balance between your dopamine and acetylcholine levels in your striatum, right? So everything works properly. If your dopamine levels get down too much, uh, your acetylcholine levels are up kind of high, then you're going to have movement disorders. And so if you can bring those acetylcholine levels, you can't do that forever, because when you bring your acetylcholine le levels down too far, what happens? You die, right? So you don't want to bring it down too much. You can bring it down a little, so that way it'll buy you a little bit of time before you have to start jacking up people's dopamine levels, which is also problematic. So I'm trying to play a little bit of a different game here. Here you go. Here's some interesting things, uh, different this is a rat brain, by the way. Different areas that have um, sort of large cholinergic areas. Uh, here's the, the guys that project up to cortex. We're also going to activate the amygdala. Hippocampus is, a, is full of acetylcholine, right? And some areas back here. This is the ventral tegmental area. So uh, we'll talk in a little bit about how acetylcholine might actually play a role in some of the... Uh, rewarding aspects of, of certain drugs. Not a big deal. Here are some anticholinergic drugs. These are the ones that are sometimes given instead of L-DOPA very early in Parkinson's disease, right? Before the, uh, again, things get too out of, out of hand. 
you don't have to really probably memorize these, but you might see folks who take some of these things. We've already talked about your basal forebrain cholinergic system, right? These are the guys that are going to shoot choline, uh, acetylcholine up to the cerebral cortex hippocampus. Right? Those are the things you need for that, those cognitive activities. Uh, here's a great neurotoxin that you're not going to have to memorize. So don't worry about it. It comes out of this soap wort plant. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are growing soap wort at home. Nobody's doing that, right? Not a big deal. Uh, but these will bind to the surface of those basal forebrain cholinergic cells. Not a big deal. This actually plays a role in, in like uh, sensory attention. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so if you knock out these, uh, these cells, rats have a difficult time uh, paying attention to like brief sensory stimuli. They'll kind of miss things, right? Uh, but if you give them drugs that alter that, then they can, um, they can actually change their attention a little bit. So we think about some of that cognitive, you don't have to memorize what any of that is, but you think about some of that cognitive enhancement and why they target the cholinergic system is because there is some evidence that indicates you know, the cholinergic system might help. It doesn't seem as though in this case we're actually going to be increasing sort of like memory or other functions. It's just sensory attention, right? So it's an attention issue. So if you were to give this to a rat and you weren't really to pay attention to how long the stimulus lasted, you know, you give them a brief stimulus, they miss that, and you think, oh, well, the cholinergic system screwed up. They can't remember anything. But if you were to extend that stimulus from, say, 25 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds, then the rat can eventually move its head around and pay attention and then they can make the correct choice. So it's not an issue necessarily of uh, enhancing their cognitive capabilities as much as it's enhancing their sensory attention, right? which makes sense, again, if it's a cortical arousal issue, uh, jacking up your acetylcholine levels would, uh, would cause that, right? This is a reason why, again, we've not been able to develop very good treatments for Alzheimer's. Even though we're targeting that cholinergic system, it may not, in fact, actually be enhancing cognitive sort of aspects. It may just be sort of enhancing uh, some attention related to it. All right. Uh, <clears throat> again, we talked a bit about how the cholinergic system can affect that dopaminergic system, right? Which is why. Uh, nicotine might be uh, you know, so reinforcing, right? Nicotine obviously is something that's going to activate the cholinergic system, but that's also going to activate the dopaminergic system, right? And so that's going to become, a, uh, become an issue. I'm imagining uh, most of you will, will see folks who are dealing with nicotine addictions, right? I mean, that's a pretty common thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you all probably know someone who's dealing with that, right? Uh, trying to discontinue their nicotine use. So. Uh, it becomes a difficult thing, right? So there you go. And uh, some of you may see folks who have uh, sleep disorders. Obviously, acetylcholine is going to play a role in that. Let's talk briefly about these different kinds of <coughs> receptor types. There's the nicotinic and the muscarinic. Not a big deal. Uh, muscarine actually comes from a mushroom. So that's kind of fun, right? Nicotine, by the way, comes from tobacco. On that one. I know. Nobody knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, nicotinic receptors are ionotropic. As soon as you open one of those guys, sodium and calcium flood in, depolarizing the cell. Not a big deal. Here you go. That's a nicotinic receptor. Sodium comes in. Not a big deal. There are a ton of subunits. I don't want you to get bogged down with this, okay? This is not something that's going to be that helpful for you. Uh, if you're really interested, please revisit this because this is actually kind of cool business, right? Because the nicotinic uh, receptors, they have five different subunits. There are different kinds of these different subunits, and we can create interesting combinations, right, by taking different subunits and mixing and matching them to create different types of uh, nicotinic receptors on different types of neurons. Okay. So like here's the one that's in the muscle, here's one, uh, well, there are actually a couple varieties that are in neurons, so they're not going to be exactly the same. And you can see here are the acetylcholine binding sites. Some of these have multiple binding sites, some just have a few. 
Does that make sense? If it doesn't, that's okay. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, what is kind of something to think about here is only certain types of these receptor combinations have been implicated in the cognitive effects, right? Some of them are implicated in other uh, things. As we get better about describing and understanding particular receptor mechanics, we can target those better. And instead of giving these sort of broad overarching uh, acetylcholine you know, modulators, maybe we could target specific receptor subtypes and, and, and get uh, uh, more finer, finer tuned effects. There you go, you can take a look at this and see the places where we have different sorts of receptors. Not a big deal. This is not such a big deal. Uh, receptors are open, they're closed, or they're desensitized, which means they're not able to be opened. Uh, there's some brief period of time that they're not able to be opened. The issue with this is if you continue to expose someone to an agonist, it's going to put them it's going to more likely uh, put them in a desensitized state, right? Which is also a problem, right? If you're giving someone an acetylcholine agonist, for example, eventually those receptors are going to switch over to that desensitized state, and then you're not going to really, it's going to lose its effectiveness, right? So you're going to lose uh, the ability of that agonist to actually work. So then you might decide to increase the dosage of that agonist, uh, which can then increase the risk of detrimental side effects. Just sort of a, a mechanism of tolerance that we might think about. You can resensitize these, but that kind of happens spontaneously. So not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that too much. Here's a muscle relaxant. You guys might see folks who use muscle relaxants, right? I mean, that's a thing. Uh, so semicolon used in surgical procedures. Uh, what's interesting is um, it's similar to acetylcholine, right? It kind of has a similar part there, but it's a little different. It's not broken down by acetylcholine esterase, so it can get in there and it can activate those receptors, uh, cause the depolarization uh, block of the muscle cells, right? So it can get in, it can block these things, and not actually, uh, you know, cause you to have contractions, right? So it's going to actually relax the muscles and, and then uh, you know you can have a surgical procedure, do what you need to do. So that's pretty cool, right? They'll give this sometimes in addition to the uh, uh, to, to the anesthetic, right? The problem with this is uh, if you are too relaxed on the muscles, you stop breathing, right? And so you might have to uh, be on a ventilator for this. This guy was previously used as an anti-hypertensive agent. Has you ever uh, seen somebody with high blood pressure? Yeah, like a lot of folks have high blood pressure, right? I mean, it's a fairly common uh, phenomenon. Uh, again, what's the problem with giving someone a cholinergic agent to treat their blood pressure? All the possible side effects, right? If you're screwing around with all those other systems. There are much better ways to treat high blood pressure now, so we give people that instead. Uh, this is the guy that's in uh, Curare. We already talked about that. Not a big deal. We could talk about muscarinic receptors. You've got sort of five types of that. They work on that second messenger system. Remember we talked about those G-coupled uh, proteins and all that fun stuff, right? Not a big deal. Uh, they actually uh, can cause some other things to happen. Mostly these are going to be hippocampus, hypothalamus, midbrain, dopamine areas. Not a big deal. They do contribute to that excitatory effect on dopamine receptors, uh, which is also mediated by those nicotinic receptors. So these guys work in conjunction with that, right? So you can kind of see this intertwined nature of everything that's going on. Definitely involved in uh, dependence producing effects of drugs. Don't worry about this one too much. Although later we'll talk about the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens in detail, it would be really nice to keep in mind that acetylcholine input to the VTA, right? When we think about that, this pathway with the, the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, that is your primary uh, drug addiction reward pathway, right? And so when that thing becomes stimulated, whatever you did to get that activated is going to be something you're going to want to do again, right? So 
whatever it was that got this guy running. There you go. Hey, here's an easy way uh, to, uh, you know, really you know, make cocaine not rewarding. Knock out your uh, M5 receptors, right? So that's kind of interesting. I don't know if anybody's, you know, trying to do that. Uh, dealing with a patient who, who's got a cocaine use problem. Forget therapy. Just uh, do some genetic engineering. Get rid of their N5, their M5 uh, muscarinic receptor jigs, and that ought to solve it, right? A little hard to do after the fact. Like once you've already got these guys, you can't really get rid of them. You could potentially block them, though, right? I mean, that's something to think about. Like a pharmacological agent that might block these receptors, right? And so that could be something that could help with um, drug addiction. There you go. These are knockout mice. Not a big deal. Uh, these are regular mice. So as you give them more morphine, they're more likely to spend time in the part of the cage where they got morphine. That makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, doesn't really work that way with uh, those knockout mice. They don't really catch on that that's where you get the morphine. Not a big deal. Cardiac muscle. This is actually something that I think is sort of interesting. Um, I try to always think about I don't know, you guys are required to work in the state of West Virginia for how long after you graduate? No. You're not? You better well, not be. Not <laughs> they're going to pay you. Then isn't that part of the deal, like it's focused on rural? You can find rural somewhere else. You don't have to try to become a Virginia, but they're not like it's on the contract or anything. Like they, like they encourage it, but yeah, it's not like a mandate. How many of you are going to stay in West Virginia? If they pay me. Come back to Wheelersburg? No. <laughs> no. I don't, don't blame you on that either. They don't die like a rise there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care about me, I don't care about them. Yeah. Uh, so, how many of you think like diabetes is a, um, is a health issue in this area? Yeah, right? So, what's sort of interesting about this is the connection between acetylcholine and diabetes, right? So now we're now see now we're just adding this extra wrinkle on top of this, right? Which is kind of cool. There are muscarinic receptors on those insulin secreting cells in the pancreas. So that's something, right? Uh, cardiac muscle. We could talk about that, but you guys get the basic idea. Not a big deal. Uh, we talked about that guy like atropine that's going to shut down some of this. A lot of drugs that they'll give you to treat psychiatric disorders will have some cholinergic effects, right? They'll have some action on the cholinergic system. They may not be targeting the cholinergic system specifically, but they're going to have some cholinergic action. Uh, have you guys seen anybody, this is a pretty common one, like dry mouth, right? As a side effect for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, psychotropic medications. Because it's messing around with those muscarinic receptors, it's blocking the muscarinic receptors. So I'm wondering, like I, I occasionally watch television and I pay attention to the commercials because I, I like to pay attention to like what does this network think I am, <laughs> right? Because you don't know, you guys don't you, don't, you don't pay attention to this, I know. So you're watching a television program and what set of commercials come on, you know, you think these like ads that you get on your cell phone and Facebook or whatever, that's not new. They're better at it now. At collecting data from you. They've been collecting data about you since the beginning of advertising, right? They're not going to waste their advertising dollars. So if you're watching program A, the people who watch program A are interested in products one, two, three, four. The people who watch program B are interested in five, six, seven, eight, right? So if you're watching this particular program, you're probably not going to see a commercial for this product over here, right? It just doesn't happen. And the time you watch them too. Mm -hmm. That makes a big like difference. Like Wheel of Fortune time, they're not <laughs> advertising for young people. Yeah. Like that's the old folks that are actually it home is. at that time. Mm -hmm. It is, right? So you're going to see like all of your like... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or not Wheel of Fortune, I meant, um, what's Jeopardy. one? Jeopardy. No, the one during the daytime. The price daytime. is right. Yes. The price is right, yeah. That yeah. That's, that's when you see your defense commercials, yes. your oh, Icy oh, Hot, yeah. your um, yeah. orthotic insoles, <laughs> right? Icy Hot is the shit. Icy Hot for everyone. <laughs> So so says, when you get the payday loans. Yep. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Right. Now, uh, what I've noticed is recently an increase 
in the advertising for biotin, which is a right, so which is a treatment for dry mouth. And I'm wondering if that's uh, uh, that's like a mouthwash. Mm -hmm. I think they may have toothpaste too, but I know they have a mouthwash. So I'm wondering if there's like uh, a correlated increase in uh, you know psychotropic medication doses. And those folks, those biotin folks, are like, man, we're gonna make some money on these dry mouth people who are depressed. <laughs> Which channel? I don't know. Which channel in general? Just in general. Okay. Do you watch TV? Depressed channel. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's a lot the of news. <laughs> it's the yeah. news. Believe me, a lot of depressed people watch the news. Now, I don't know if they were depressed before the news <laughs> or after the news, but I know there's a high correlation between how much news you watch and how depressed you are. That's certain. So there you go. That's an interesting connection, though, right? So if you have a patient who's dealing with dry mouth, and they're, uh, what might you suggest them to do? You get a dry mouth product, which you now know exists, yeah. which you didn't before. No. Uh, but what about those like pancreatic cells, right? This is actually kind of interesting. Uh, when you release acetylcholine, it actually goes to those beta cells, right? Uh, and they stimulate insulin secretion, which is kind of cool. And we could actually potentially use that as a target for uh, type 2 diabetes. The problem is, like, if you start increasing people's acetylcholine levels, you know, you might increase the amount of insulin that gets released, right? That can cause some, some uh, imbalance with their glucose levels. Flip side of this, what if you start decreasing their acetylcholine levels, right? And then you can start adjusting uh, things in the other direction, so you might cause them some... Uh, some diabetic issues, one way or the other, right? If they're on a on a cholinergic agent, so that's something to watch for. Uh, here's some other drugs uh, that are uh, like muscarinic receptors. Obviously, muscarine, pilocarpine uh, comes from a shrub in South America. Uh, you know, your betel nut. These can actually uh, act as though you know they're uh, they kind of mimic the parasympathetic system. So if you were to poison someone with uh, with this you could have some exaggerated responses uh, you could uh, lacrimate which uh, means you cry right so that's tearing uh, salivate you'll sweat you'll have pinpoint pupils so your pupils will <laughs> write down and you'll be beady eyed uh, and then of course everyone's favorite you get the severe abdominal pain and Painful diarrhea, not just regular diarrhea. <laughs> you get the painful variety. I know, right, Corey? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So, uh, if you do want to poison someone, there you go. That's why I've been waiting for. That's why you've been. The only reason you took this class <laughs> is to figure out how to poison people. You want to start giving people painful diarrhea. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? Just a one-stop shopping right there on your poisons. <laughs> we already talked a little bit about atropine and scopolamine, right? Uh, this actually includes the deadly nightshade, right? That's the, uh, the trope of belladonna, right? So we could have a little conversation here about the use of deadly nightshade, uh, which atropine is a you know derivative of that. This has actually been used for millennia, right? So, um, in sort of ancient times, females would put deadly nightshade in their, in their eyes, so it would sort of increase their, their pupil diameter. So there was a, so this is going to be an interesting side story here that I think you're going to enjoy. There was a um, study done a number of years ago where they would show people pictures of things, and when they would show people pictures of things they liked, their pupils would get bigger. And when they showed them pictures of things they didn't like, their pupils would get smaller. So the idea is that if your pupils are bigger, the person who's looking at you will think you like them. Right? Right? So this, right, Destiny? You think this is funny, but this is true, right? So this is, this is the whole concept behind eye makeup now, right? Why do you use eye makeup to make your eyes look bigger? Because apparently <laughs> that makes other people think you like them. Yeah. What? Is that your ringtone? Yeah, it's the uh, 
Yeah. Car back out. Backing out. Backing out. You know, like a, mm-hmm. some kind no, of no, it was, uh, yeah. it's, uh, that's the Sputnik signal. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's the Sputnik signal. That makes a nice ring bell. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Jason, this one's just for you. When my wife calls me, um, <laughs> my phone yells at me in the voice of Skeletor. You witless fools, must I do everything around here? Uh, so I, I briefly had this app called Skeletor. It was originally named uh, Skeletor. And so it had all of these like catchphrases. And you could, you could like save those as ringtones on your phone. Unfortunately, I had to reset my phone a while back. And I ended up accidentally deleting that app. And it's no longer available for download on the Google Play Store. So I'm really disappointed. So I saved a few uh, before I deleted it accidentally, or you know, inadvertently you save them. So I have a few, and that's one I still have. So, yeah, it's worth a while. So Deadly Nightshade, you're going to make your, your eyes look bigger, right? Um, I think this is, you know, like if you're trying to convince someone else that you like them, that's a great way to do it, and just make your eyes bigger. Um, on top of that, if you sort of wanted to um, adjust your standards a little bit, because as your eyes get bigger, for those of you who have had your pupils dilated, <laughs> or not, no. things are fuzzy, right? And so no. you might be more willing to accept some um, <laughs> physical attributes. Uh, that, that, right? Yeah. Yes, right? Yeah. So there you go, right? So there you go. Make your, your deadly nightshade. Make your pupils bigger. The other person will think you like them, and you're not going to really tell what they look like. That's so sad. It works. This might be the sweetest story you've ever told, though. <laughs> not saying much. What? That's not saying much. I know, but there you go, right? Uh, so I don't know if any of you are, you know, trying to convince someone you like them. Uh, make your eyes bigger. That always works. Don't waste your time on anything else. <laughs> Next time you go to a party, just look around with your eyes wide. <laughs> yeah, so then that's the thing, you got to worry about those beady eyed people. Right? <laughs> I think about that because, so if your eyes are open and you think like, oh, well that person likes me because their eyes are nice and big, and then you meet somebody who's kind of, well that person doesn't like me, why are they squinting at me all the time? <laughs> They're beady eyes. It's just our face. <laughs> Maybe just. So there you go. That's a fun story about Denley Nightshade. Well. I thought it was an interesting story. Dudley's actually in the name. It's on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there mom Dudley Nightshade? Like diet Nightshade? Like, like, like just uncomfortable nightshade, <laughs> slight beating nightshade. Uh, like no, it's like I, a stubbed toe, like you're not happy about it. I think but. it only comes in the deadly variety. Now, you don't have to take all of it at once. Um, oh my. Hey, this is just for you Ohio residents. Atropine <laughs> <laughs> is used in ophthalmology to dilate pupils. Yeah. I thought that was like standard. It, it, I always thought it was for people that had just like I thought, really yeah, it was a special problem. treatment. Yeah, yeah. Whole, yeah. I've only known a few people who have been. that done. Like so how many of you have had your pupils like dilated? Every time you oh, yeah. no. 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 <laughs> I've never had this many people that have had that. No, yeah. I've lived in Ohio. <laughs> so why, no, why do they only do it for certain people in Ohio? I have no idea. Because I've known like two girls that had that done. The only person that I've heard of having that done had like glasses from like day one out of the womb. So yeah, like she was blind as a bat. So like, is it just part <laughs> of the eye test? <laughs> it's it's not part of the eye test, so to speak. It's part of the eye exam, um, which is just like the same thing. No, uh, because th- this is something like the eye test is something you have to do, right? Mm-hmm. The eye exam is something the ophthalmologist does to you. So they give you that to make your pupils bigger so they can see your retina better. Yeah, I just so just they want to see. Taking your <laughs> eye health. It's Why do they want to see? Wow. They want to see your retina to make sure you're, you know, like your retina's not detached, make sure you don't have macular degeneration, 
Like uh, nobody in my family's ever had that. If you're diabetic, you, ha you can have some degeneration of your retina. They're looking for retinal diseases. Wow. It, it's sort of an important. It's very important. <laughs> I mean, None of my family I'm has had that. Done. That like blows my mind. Not everybody even goes to the eye doctor. It can't be that important. Well, like I didn't go to the eye doctor until my eyes started fucking up. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like that's not a thing, is it? Maybe regular point. eye exam yeah. should yeah. be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should. So go it's like the same. I mean, some people have no health care. Yeah. Like, no, you should go to the dentist every that's six months. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, you go to the dentist. You should go to the eye should... doctor about every two years if you don't wear glasses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you should go about every two years. Oh. Okay. For not for just for an annual eye exam. If you if you have glasses, you should obviously probably probably go much more often. Mm -hmm. There's an article about some places don't use drops, they use a machine instead. So the machine is opening my pupils? They tell they it says they want drops in the right? They do. You can't drive. Oh, okay. Well, they have some drops now that are not as powerful and they, they wear off faster. So that's uh, that's typically what I've had done. They'll put the drops in, your pupils will dilate just for a brief period of time and then so you don't have to wear the glasses. Yeah, it says it uses lasers instead. Huh. Maybe we've had that done. I, know. I don't know if Attica has the high tech. Mine doesn't have that. Willard has it. They have a good hookup. Willard. Mine doesn't. You I'm sure you Yeah, that, I've been to both. Attica doesn't have any doctors. We have a chiropractor. Well, there So, Jason, you've had your eyes tested, whatever, right? Uh, scopolamine is another thing that you can do to make people drowsy. This thing actually used to be used uh, during birth, right? So uh, they would give people scopolamine, women, in conjunction with some of the other medications to sort of, uh, uh, it, it's sort of a dissociative a little bit. Doesn't really, uh, you know, doesn't really put you out so much, but you can still do the things you need to do. Not a big deal. Again, we don't want to give you too much because you can uh, have some problems that can be toxic. So here is a nice chart if you want to look at the drugs that affect the cholinergic system, how they affect the cholinergic system. Up or down, agonist or antagonist. Questions about acetylcholine? Just for the people that don't know, 